I'm going to cover two topics. One is uh, meta model, and the other is a completion to metaphors that we started yesterday. Okay, so, oh, some people are excited about that. Nice. Yeah. Um, uh, personally, the metaphors are my favorite. It's like my, it's like if there's one tool that I love from everything that I do, it's, it's metaphors. It's, uh, I can't tell you how incredibly powerful it is. Some of you have seen the EIS uh, work with each other. You remember that from day one I've been telling you the EIS will do this, EIS will do that. Their tool is also metaphor. Um, personally, there was a girl in my, in my organization. She, she now got married and she had to move to a different city. But during the phase she was working with us, there was a time when her mother went to uh, a specific uh, form of medical condition where she was developing fibroids. And uh, um, uh, for me, uh, so, so, so the, the, what the girl did was she used a specific set of metaphors to help her mother overcome that challenge. The beautiful part was the metaphor came from the mother. What she did was to identify that it was not some garbage talk and uh, take the metaphor that mother was using and spin it around in a way that it would actually help her recover. Uh, same thing with uh, a, a friend of mine. In, uh, he was in our team for a while and his father had a heart uh, attack. And uh, he was noticing that in the hospital, uh, the father was not necessarily recovering the way he felt his father could recover. And moreover, there was a situation going on that, you know, he felt like the father was, uh, uh, there were like too many negative suggestions given and the father was actually going into a state of believing everything and not necessarily fighting to recover fully. And uh, see, th there are some moments in your life when, you know, you could see something in front of your eyes, you know that it's slipping through your fingers and sometimes it's so important and dear to you and you don't know what to do about it. And every single time I've noticed that if you're equipped with metaphors, that you find a way to, to turn that situation around and, you know, make things happen. So for, for him, for Ashish, the, he was there, his father is saying things to him, and he has that window there, right? Because his father is opening up and saying the things in between meetings, like he can't be there with his father. He only has like a visiting hours. It's like that intuition. It's like that moment that kicks in saying, hey, now let me say this set of stories. Now let me say this set of embedded commands. And that's the magic. Okay, so if, if Ashish could have those list of stories in his head, in a diary, but when, he's, when that thing is going on, if it doesn't come naturally to him at that point in time, it's of no, it's of no use, right? So I, I hold on to my original frame, okay? State, structure, content. So if you want to really become good with metaphors, you want to first make sure that you are in high performance in challenging situations. And the alphabet game that you've been playing is actually preparation for that. Is that sometimes in life that there is, a, there is a critical situation, you know that is the moment you, you either can do something or not do something, and you want to first be prepared to do something at that moment. Does that make sense? Like the, the, the analogy I give is, you know, if somebody is going on a picnic, like, uh, you know, if the, if the family picnic, for example, if somebody is going on a family picnic, the father would wake up early in the morning and he would check the, the you know, tires if there's air and then there's oil in the car, and then... Uh, um, the coolant, um, <laughs> and then the mother would, you know, make all the preparation for the food. And if there's a child at home, you know, the, the son would, like, uh, make sure his uh, recharge is done so that he can SMS. <laughs> and, um, I mean, uh, to go on a vacation or a small picnic, if you do so much preparation, how much more preparation do you need in order to be equipped to say the right unconscious story at the right time. Um, in my opinion, up is about that, okay? So you may learn how to do the tell these stories, 
But where do you learn to be ready to tell this story spontaneously? I think that happens over, over here. Uh, simply because you have access to a variety of consequences that are happening in front of your eyes. Okay. Uh, by the way, some of you have a reference of how people came here on day one. Okay. You have a reference of some of the challenges of people sitting next to you, and you have a reference of how some of them are shifting. Do you also have references of some behaviors that you traits their the energy that, you're, that they're sharing change, even though they may not have worked on it with a pattern. You do have that reference, right? How is it happening? Okay. Now, each time you come back, what happens is that you're mirroring. You're not only picking up the stories, but also that state of mind that allows me personally to give that story at that right moment. You remember a simple metaphor like you can eat the candy, but then you won't have it unless you want to have another set of box, satisfying both the intentions. Right? So those are things that happen spontaneously. And I think if you, if you, the priority is always state. Okay? There's no, there is no replacement for that. Okay? However, I'm going to give you the structure and the content for metaphors. I'm going to give you exercises for you to go and prepare them by yourself. But I want you to be clear about the fact that you can learn the metaphors, but if you want to really accelerate delivering it, you need to also mirror, come back, and get the state in which the metaphors can actually be delivered. You get the distinction. OK, great. So uh, yesterday, I gave you an example of a metaphor. And I said there is a pacing to it. And then after the pacing, there's a one-to-one -one pacing. And then you either end the metaphor with a positive consequence or a negative consequence. Um, and yesterday, I also gave you an ex assignment. I said that uh, um, go over some of the stories of uh, Milton Erickson. OK, so uh, uh, did, you, did, you, uh, did you go over it? How many of you went over some stories, some context? Wow, OK, so many of you. That's nice. OK, that's, that's wonderful. So did you do an assignment on that? Uh, OK, so what did you learn? Do you want to share some learning? How many of you, first of all, was it easy to do an isomorphic or homomorphic? Yes. Just the first step. Is it isomorphic or homomorphic? Yes. Well, so yesterday I said that, well, it's actually, actually, you know what? If you have more than one person in the problem, most times it is a homomorphic metaphor. Uh, because you need, you need the metaphor to address more than one. One person. Um, how many of you found the mapping? How many of you could do the mapping? To some extent, could you? Do you want to share? Uh, I could find that all the stories yeah. were more of a contextual base. Pardon me. Mo uh, this uh, metaphor were yeah. more of a contextual base, wherein what is my state of mind or what is my issues, I could able to relate to it, because I and Rujuta we two both were doing it. And we both were uh, thinking of a very different uh, stories around. I, I felt the interpretation something in this line, and she felt it into a very different line of the same story. The question is, how does the listener's unconscious <laughs> interpret? So that's good, that if you're having differences, then you can run to me. OK, so you know what? We're not going to go over your exercise. But what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a set of metaphors right now, and we're going to repeat the exercise right now over here so that you can validate for yourself if that is the same way you did the assignment. And in my opinion, if you can go back home and do these assignments, that's the best way to develop your nuances of, of metaphors. Does that make sense? OK, so let me give you one metaphor. So uh, this I think I've seen with Richard uh, in, a, in a Bandler's video. So this is, a, this is a metaphor that I've seen uh, Bandler use in his uh, seminar called Persuasion Engineering. OK, and Persuasion Engineering is a seminar that he runs for business people to come in and uh, multiply their business. So the target audience, the participants who are sitting there, are our audience who are sitting there for the purpose of improving their business. And some of them are there to improve their sales. And, uh, uh, the, and you know, in, 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 during one of the days in persuasion engineering, uh, Bandler starts talking about how there was a point in his life where he did flirting workshop. And he said that it's very surprising that we ran a flirting workshop 
Only the single people came in. Uh, he, he said that it's as if the married ones have forgotten that they can continue to flirt with each other. And then he said that in his workshop that he had this line of people, you know, the guy, girls on one side and the guys on the other. And they did an exercise where the girls were supposed to cue to the guy in some way that they liked him. And, you know, like, like, uh, like uh, give that side look or twirl the hair or do whatever. And, uh, <laughs> and the guy was supposed to uh, identify, like, which of the girls liked him or not, or gave the signal, and which girls didn't. And Bandler said more than 88% of the people got it absolutely wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, why would Bandler speak that metaphor in a persuasion engineering workshop? So let's start with the, pardon me? Pardon me? Sales call. Yeah, so let's go over that s s setup, okay? Is it isomorphic metaphor or a homomorphic metaphor? Iso. Pardon me? Iso. 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 Okay, how many of you say isomorphic? How many of you say homomorphic? Okay. So, <laughs> okay, so those of you who say isomorphic, okay, let's look at the mapping. What are the elements in the story? Okay, people flirting, married couples, single people. Okay, so let's say married couple. The person who, the, the married couple indicates who? Existing customers and the, and the person. Single people indicates people who don't, who don't have prospects. The girl and the guy in the line indicates new customer. The girls who gave the interest indicate the right market or the right customer. So now can you decode the metaphor? What's the metaphor? No, I mean, it, it is isomorphic, but what's the, what's the essence of the metaphor? There are two things, okay, that for most people... Is that you need to continue selling to your... Existing customers. Existing, yeah. Right, that's the far, that's the far part about... Uh, it's like they forgot that they can continue to flirt with each other. That's yeah. about continuing to sell and do business with existing customers. customers. Okay, what's the second point? You know, that uh, the thing about the, there were these men over here and women over here, and they got the calibration absolutely wrong. So this is the calibration that salespeople do wrong, the, yeah. understanding that uh, who are interested and who are not interested, the prospects who are not interested. Absolutely. So, we'll, so first of all, if there are some salespeople or business people sitting over there for whom that reality is true, which means they are trying to sell to the wrong market or to the wrong target audience, then that particular story will have an impact on those specific business people or salespeople. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's how metaphors work. Okay, isn't it simple enough now yeah. when you look at it this way? Antonio? No? Yes. Uh, yeah. You started saying that uh, married people hadn't come in this. What, pardon me? You started saying that married people hadn't come in this. Yeah. And that's the reason I said isomorphic, because it was just one type of, uh, I mean, the isomorphic. new. isomorphic. Sorry, homomorphic. Wherein it is just uh, one set of people and one set of trait. No, look at the elements, customers. The person you're talking to, there are two elements. Okay, in fact, if you don't get the isomorphic, homomorphic, it's okay. Do you at least get the concept? The con do you get the one-to-one -one parallel? That I got. That okay, I what is the verb? Let's go to the third step. What's the verb? Flirting. <laughs> no. No. Matching. Ma matching your product to the market that wants to buy. Right? That's the second part of the metaphor. You remember the second part of the metaphor is matching. That's the verb. So the first verb would be reusing. Second verb would be matching. So th that's the exercise. So this is exactly what I want you to do with the metaphors in the Milton's book. Stories. See, there are the, the reason I'm re recommending you read the stories from that particular book is we don't have any shortage of stories, but we do have a shortage of the consequences the stories have produced. 
in order for you to train yourself to learn metaphors, like when somebody has a problem of, you know, um, they, they haven't been able to sleep for 22 years, and they go to Milton and he tells a story, and you know that particular story has helped that person sleep. Now you have the story and you have the consequence. And then you, you go isomorphic or homomorphic, don't get stuck on it, and then do the mapping, and then finally come to the, to the verb. Okay, let me give you another example. So there was once when a friend of mine who was a marketing um, expert uh, had this big conference, and he said that he's going to go and prime his, uh, his uh, audience. He's going to teach his audience certain marketing fundamentals. But then he came up with, to me with this challenge saying, um, the biggest difficulty for him is that no matter what he teaches them, he's unable to shift the mindset of some marketeers to, you know, they, they come up with these, so some, he said in, 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 in companies that he trained that he has these marketing guys, uh, you know, sometimes who are making business decisions, who are managing P&L, they come up with this beautiful, aggressive plan on what they want to achieve, okay? But then he, he proposed that there is a small mindset issue that is making that plan completely useless, okay? I'm not going to tell you what that mindset is. I'm going to tell you the story that I gave in order to handle that mindset, and I want you to, you to figure out what the mindset is. Okay? So the story goes like this. Like, I have this friend of mine. Uh, he, he, he loves uh, going and visiting tribal communities. Um, and once he was exploring tribal communities in, uh, in the Africa region, and, uh, you know, a helicopter comes and drops him, and he's supposed to meet the tribal chief at a particular point, and he gets dropped over there, and he's supposed to meet the tribal chief. And uh, as he lands over there, you know, he's dropping from a parachute, he lands, and he goes to the point where he's supposed to meet the tribal chief, and the tribal chief is not there. Instead, there is a car, and inside the car, there is a note. The note says, there is some important ceremony that is going on, and I have to be there. So I'm not able to be with you, but what I've left is a compass and a map so that you could navigate and come to the, the community and join me there. Okay, so, uh, and then my friend, you know, he goes through the, uh, the map and suddenly he has this tight catch in his stomach. When he recognizes that nowhere in the map is marked his current location. Okay, so what do you think is the mind to change? Here, like he doesn't, he knows the map of going somewhere, so you know that goal or a target, but you don't know where do you stand today, so what will be my action today? Absolutely. So, you know, he said the problem that Nandana mentioned is that he said there are people who take up certain uh, business positions or sometimes come as consultants and they chart a plan of where the business should go and how it has to be done without adequately studying where they currently are, or where that organization currently is. Now obviously, you have to also remember, when I do metaphors like this, I don't stop with one metaphor. I go on a spree, right? I do 10 metaphors that have the same pattern. But, and, and also remember that the part of that where I said, you know, the African community, and he went in a helicopter, he gets dropped. What is the purpose of that? Distraction. It's to involve the conscious mind in. The last part of the story is the actual metaphor. So it's like state elicitation, distraction, whatever it is. And then at the end is where the metaphor is actually being delivered. So market condition is the map, the, the element of the location on the map is the current market, market condition. condition. And uh, the person in the story is the person who's taking up marketing marketing role. So is it simple mapping enough? Yes. Okay, great. Let me give you more examples. Um, what as an example? <laughs> I have a funny example. Um, um, I have a couple of examples. Uh, the first one is very funny. You know, this is this uh, photographer in one of these, uh, the first up even that I did in Chennai. And I used to have this uh, little uh, uh, a phobia for camera, I think. And, 
uh, but but and, and the photograph worsened it by the way and uh, um, because I used to bring people up on stage and uh, and he would be like uh, I'm really like close your eyes click 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 and go into a deep click 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 state click 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 and uh, and then I looked at him and he gave me this you know see I'm clicking more pictures <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he was a completely inexperienced uh, guy, and uh, so uh, we I, I, it was break, and I was uh, standing in the lobby, and uh, um, there was this beautiful melody that was going on, and uh, it was a Tamil composition by Ile Raja, and uh, there was this piano version of it going on, and uh, I was just so immersed in the beauty of that music, and guess who comes next to me? <laughs> the photographer. And uh, the photographer comes next to me, and uh, uh, I look at him, and he says, such a beautiful song. I said, yeah, just listen to how each of those notes means so much in itself. And then I looked at him, and I said, do you, do you hear how each note is so spaced out? These days, musicians think that the more number of notes the, no, 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 they go, the better musician they are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for a moment he had this uh, dilation in his pupil, and uh, obviously when I deliver metaphor, I change the topic or, or I go somewhere else, right? So I let him be. But it was interesting, right? Consciously, he doesn't know that we were talking about <coughs> photography. But when he came back, he was a very different ma a person, you know? He, he, he didn't count his photos by the clicks he was taking. He started coming and showing me the photos that he was taking to see whether that was working for me. There's a big shift in, in mindset. Then I, then, and then I stacked it up, obviously. Uh, one of the things I told him is, you know, that um, I gave him the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the metaphor of wildlife photography. I said that, you know, that I have some friends. Uh, it's very interesting because this is such a profession that requires so much patience. I said, I don't know how photographers do this. You know, there's a friend of mine who's a wildlife photographer, and I said he, he actually waits for two, three hours um, um, uh, to get that animal that he's tracking to come in the, in the position that he, that he wants it to be in before he clicks. I mean, that was just my way of attempting to make him a, a better photographer. So, but you get, the, you get the point now, how metaphors, metaphors work. Put what were you saying? You, you're guessing the metaphor, okay. He was waiting for the perfect shot. Yeah. So yeah. that's the that's the metaphor. Yeah. Waiting. That's the verb. Wait. Right. That's the that's the verb. Um, so a lady came to me who was um, I've shared this metaphor with some of you before. Um, a lady came to me uh, with uh, and also when I choose metaphor, I choose something from their life, something that they can connect to. Okay, so this lady came, comes to me and she was like, uh, for 10 years, she was a homemaker. She took care of a child and then she, she said, the her problem was, she said that she was, uh, uh, she said she was uh, feeling like she wasted 10 years. Like she, she felt like as if now if she goes back into business or tries to get a job, the world has changed so much and she's not developed any real experience or skill in those, in those 10 years. And she was thinking that because she had to conceive and give birth to a child, she wasted those, those 10 years. Um, so so what, I, what I did for her is, now, by the way, you have to realize that when Bandler did the story of the, the people flirting, you remember the story? How does the unconscious mind connect that story to, to business? How does it know that's the context? Pardon me? Because we are already in the business and we are not in the school or college. <laughs> Be because they have come to a workshop called Persuasion Engineering, right? So you could tell a turtle on the hair story for all you care, but the way the brain will interpret the story is based on the context of where you are. So sometimes that we call that a scope, okay? So sometimes the scope is already set. Sometimes the scope is not said. So with this lady, one of the things I did is I spoke to her and I said, I said, you know, when you were taking care of your child in the beginning, 
Did you have developed this intuition where in the beginning you didn't know what the child wanted, but over a period of time this intuition, an analog mark intuition, this intuition began to develop in you so well that you could predict what the child wanted, wanted next? She said yes. And then I told her, were there, were there moments when you're taking care of this child and suddenly you felt so overwhelmed because there were too many things to handle and you found yourself becoming smarter and able to make more time in the sense that you were able to manage time better and becoming good at multitasking. She said, yes. Now what are the two things that I've analog marked? Intuition, Intuition and multi time and multi multitasking. Right now I've, I've, I've done that. So this is my anchor. Okay. Now I'm going to come back to that anchor a little later. So then I told her, and she came from a background where she read a lot of the Bible. Okay? So I, I obviously picked the metaphor from the Bible. So I said, have you heard of the story of David and Goliath? And she said, of course. And I said, you know, what is interesting to me about the story of David and Goliath is that David was a shepherd boy, and he used to spend the night guarding his sheep. And in order for him to guard a sheep, he had to sometimes chase wolves away. Now there's a difference between someone who's taking care of the sheep and someone who is guarding the sheep because they have an attachment to it. You know, when someone who's taking care of the sheep, if the wolf comes, they would run away. But if you own that sheep, there's, you're going to fight. And that's what David was doing. He felt ownership. He felt so attached to that sheep that he was taking care of that when the wolves would come, he would, he would use his weapon to chase them away. And I said that it's interesting because when the battle between Philistine and Israel was going on, and when Goli and you know, they agreed to the, that the winner, you know, a single man battle, the winner would, would, would rule over both the kingdoms. And when Goliath is coming and asking, is there no man who can, who can fight? And David is just a shepherd boy. He's going to give food for his brothers. And he hears this taunt and he says, okay, I'm going to go in and fight. And, and uh, you know, everybody's surprised, but this is, since there's no other taker, they allow him to go and fight. Now, the first thing that the king does, King Saul, is he tries to put the armor and the sword that he uses, that the military uses on, on David. And David does something very interesting. He puts the thing and he says, I haven't proven this before, as in I haven't used this before. I would rather go with what I am, I've been training myself for years with. And then he takes away all that shield and sword and he puts them aside and he goes on with the sling and the stone. And then he meets Goliath and then, you know, one shot and Goliath just falls flat on the floor. Fast forward 2,000 years now, we know that what Goliath, Goliath had was a weapon that is as powerful as a pistol. What David had was a weapon that is as powerful as a pistol. Goliath didn't have a chance, right? Because he's with a sword coming from far, and David had a weapon with, with you know, the sling actually goes so fast. It's about 200 um, rotations per minute. And then the stone is made of a particular um, a mineral that actually increases the momentum so much that it actually has the impact of a, of a bullet. Now, David didn't knew he was doing any of this. All he knew was he was taking care of the, the sheep. David had no clue that when he was sitting there and taking care of the sheep, he was actually training himself to use a pistol <laughs> to fight the enemy that was coming at him. Okay, so now what would be the mapping in the story? The sheep obviously is the the, the child. Okay, now David is a David is the is a mother. David is the mother, and then David, not knowing that he, when he's training the sheep, he's actually tr getting used with a pistol. Is the mother has no idea of the skills that she is building. Now, you remember in the beginning, I spoke about intuition, yes. and I spoke about multitasking. So that is for her unconscious to connect. When I say David had no idea he was 
building a pistol, in her reality, it would connect back to intuition and, and multitasking. So that's how you set up a scope, and then you go to the story. There was one more thing that I sneaked in that metaphor. The king, the king is that corporate guy say, telling the lady that, hey, tenure, you don't have this experience, you're not good at ABC, and thereby you can't do that job well. You see the mapping over there? Of course she can't do the job well in that, but she has another tool that, that, she's, that is superior, that is, that is meant for that particular job she hasn't figured out she needs to take. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's the example of David and Goliath. And obviously, right after I told her that story, now I told you I don't leave with one story, right? And especially when I tell stories, I go on a, on a loop. Right after I told the story, I told her, you know what? There was this one time in my house, there was this um, uh, baby eagle that had fallen down, and, uh, and that, that baby eagle, you know, was being attacked by crows, and, you know, they're... It was, they were about to kill the baby eagle, so I went and I rescued it. I, I chased the crows away, and then I learned how to take care of that baby eagle. Uh, you know, someone came and taught me, because eagles, even if they're baby, they have like these big wings. And then on the second day, we were feeding it, and I, I met with people from the wildlife department, and they said that I have to feed this eagle for the next 10 days, because it's going to take 10 days before it can naturally fly. And a baby eagle would try to fly. It would jump and it would flap its wings. And, uh, and when it's flapping its wings, it would, uh, it would uh, try its best, but then it would fall down. And then we would pick it up and we repeated that procedure. It was on the fourth day. We were, we were feeding the eagle and it would do the same procedure. And then we took it back and we were feeding. And from, from nowhere, a crow came. Okay, and the crow came so fast so fast, and it went like this, and the eagle jumped, and it flapped its wings, and we were watching what's going to happen, and it went down like before, but as the crow chased, it started moving it a little faster, and then the eagle took off, and when the crow chased, the eagle just took, took heights and went into the, into the sky. <laughs> okay, now, I didn't say this metaphor first. I said this metaphor after telling her the David and the Goliath story. Now, there was a little doubt in her still because there is a person she was talking with at that time, okay? There was a girl she was talking with who was advising her on what corporates will look for and what corporates won't look for. You remember David, uh, King Saul? Okay, so that's the girl we're talking about who she was trying to get a job with and she was trying to become that, take on the advice of that girl that works for her but not necessarily for, for her. So I had, to, I had to finish that loop. So what I did was I gave her the story of Vikram Seth. You see, read that poet from, a poem from Vikram Seth there? It's a beautiful poem about this nightingale and this, and this frog. So there's this nightingale that's singing. It's, it has this, such a beautiful voice. And in a parallel forest, there is this frog that is croaking and croaking and croaking and croaking. And... Um, um, <clears throat> And people throw stones at it because they don't want the frog to, to croak or to, uh, to sing. So it l leaves that forest and somehow lands up in this other, other forest. And then, uh, um, you know, the, the, the nightingale finishes singing and the frog goes and tells the nightingale, I can help you sing better. And, uh, you know, I've lived longer. I'm uh, so many years old, you're just like three years. <laughs> right? And... Uh, and the nightingale looks at, compares by age. Oh, it must be a wise being. It has such, so many experience, uh, so much age to its experience. And the nightingale takes the frog as a, as a, a, a trainer, a trainer, mentor, whatever. And, and the uh, nightingale is singing and the, you know, it would be raining and the voice would be tired, but the frog would push it to sing. And then the nightingale would sing. And its voice started getting damaging. There was lesser and lesser audience. And one day, the nightingale, the frog was pushing it. It was raining. The nightingale was sick. It tries its best. And in one last puff, it actually dies. Now, one of the interesting things that I do when I'm doing this is since this particular girl was you know, looking at one particular person and it was not working out for her, 
every time I might say the frog, I would use the same visual anchor as I would use when I'm talking about that other girl <laughs> in our regular conversations. That's called analog marking, or it's called anchoring. You understand how the metaphor works. So sometimes it's an isomorphic metaphor, but you could also use anchoring to specifically indicate to the unconscious mind who or what are you referring to in that story. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK, now why would you do it using metaphors? Because then it works at the level of the unconscious mind. Um, as long as you've set the scope, the generalization starts to happen. Let me give you a few more examples. So there was this, uh, I can give you a lot, you know. Um, uh, there was this, uh, in, and this is, a, this is an example of a very quick metaphor, but it had like a super awesome effect. So I had gone to the trainers, uh, you know, I had gone to this, this place where uh, people who were called the master trainers of NLP had gathered together for an advanced training. And uh, uh, there was this uh, young guy, um, I think he must have been 35, and, uh, and he had come from a different country, and we were in the UK. And uh, there was this lady, uh, I, I'm going to change her name. Harini doesn't like me to mention real names. Um, give me a name, Rosie. OK. <laughs> so, so there was Rosie, and there was this guy. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and you know, they were having a conversation of how we wanted to move into UK. And Rosie was being a little ignorant, OK, and a little stupid, in my opinion. And she was telling him, if you're moving in, into the UK, you, must, you can't bring your cat. It's going to be difficult. Nobody's going to give you a house. She said, I can't do that. I love my cat. I can't leave it alone. And then she would be like, oh, so then you can kill it. And she's like, no, I can't kill it. And she's like, no problem. I'll do it for you, right? <laughs> And she was doing this over and over again to the point that uh, uh, he started getting a little offended. OK, I saw that look. I asked him, are you offended? And he said, no, no, it's OK. I know she doesn't mean it, blah, blah, blah. But what was going on? And you know, when she was talking about cat, you can literally see that she had this uh, allergic response to it. But what was going on is during the dinner that night, OK? So Rosie was sitting there. I'm sitting here. And this guy was sitting here. Okay, and we were having dinner that night, and, uh, and what he would do is he would say, Rosie, do you love your husband? And she'd recently gotten, I mean, she'd gotten married like six years ago, but she was, she was behaving like as if it's like they're, uh, they're like one month into marriage. And like, yeah, <laughs> Rosie, you see your husband, he's holding a cat. <laughs> <laughs> I was bursting out laughing, okay? <laughs> and she would be like, ah! And then, and then he started doing this. He would, then we would talk something else, and he would do it again. And, we would, and, and he was do, fractionating. He wasn't going on a loop immediately. He would make sure we were talking something else, and then he would do that. So after the fourth iteration, I looked at him, and I said, I think you must stop. It's, it's, I think it could lead to permanent damage. <laughs> I mean, you, you know what a collapse anchor is, right? And you know that whatever <laughs> feeling is more intense is, is going to overtake. Like I, I saw once this uh, well-intentioned psychologist working with this uh, girl who had a phobia of driving. And, uh, and uh, you know, he told her, see yourself sitting in a car. And she was going. And he, and he said, now see yourself driving the car and you're with your mother. And then he said, see yourself. And he, what he was trying to do was he was trying to bring positive association. But fear is sometimes more intense than the other feelings. So from having a phobia of uh, driving the car, he made it a phobia of everything in our life. <laughs> and uh, he did it unintentionally, but this guy was doing it intentionally. intentionally. <coughs> now, earlier that day, Rosie and I were having a conversation, and she spoke about how uh, she likes to read books, and then there are too much noise in her street. And, and but when she reads books, she doesn't hear anything. Right? So when you. Uh, when he was doing that, I looked at Rosie and I said, Rosie, do you remember how, do you remember how when you are reading your book, there could be too much noise from outside? <laughs> okay, but I do it subtly. There could be too much out noise from outside, but you just know how to put that aside and, and, and just focus on your book. And uh, uh, she said, yeah, what about it now? I said, nothing, just enjoy your food. 
um, and uh, it was interesting because he would he would attempt to you know talk to her but the moment he thinks about mentioning the cat right she would just ignore that he exists and go back to her to her foot okay so the these are examples of of metaphors um, You want more metaphors? Yes. Yeah, okay, let me give you another example. So there was this one event where I was uh, uh, sincerely teaching, um, and people, everybody was in the flow, okay? But there was this one guy who would stand up, and he would ask something that is completely irrelevant, okay? Now, he, he was making good points, but it wasn't just going along with what the rest of the group were asking, sharing, and learning. And he would do that r randomly out of the blue, right? Like you're having this conversation, and, and suddenly he'll be like, hey, what do you think about quantum physics? <laughs> like we're talking about like uh, uh, embedded commands, and he suddenly, he does that. So I said, I looked at him and I said, you know, there was this concert that I once went to, which had like this beautiful array of musicians, and an vocalist, and a drummer, a violinist, and it is one of the best symphonies I've been to, like uh, best performances. And everything was so melodical, everybody was so much in sync. You can feel like the singer, the, 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 the violinist, the guitarist, all had this groove. But you know what, it was so annoying and suddenly the drummer, and I would point at him, right? The drummer uh, thinks that he has to go on a solo roll. <laughs> and I told him, have you ever been to a, a concert where the drummer has this beautiful role but is completely out of place? <laughs> OK, now, now remember, although everybody in the room were laughing and they understood what was going on, he didn't consciously. Okay, what happens with metaphors is when you, when you match their process, even though it's so obvious to you, it isn't obvious to that person, but it makes an impact in their behavior. Okay, so um, sensibly he started asking questions that, that, uh, that were in alignment with what was going on, and when, when he wanted to ask other questions, he found me outside in the, in private. Okay, so you get an example, you get a group of, group of metaphors. Uh, let me give you some more. Okay, one more is, uh, you know, there was this, uh, in one of the events I told, uh, I told this metaphor about um, a friend of mine who wanted to learn the guitar. Okay, and what happened was he and I went to this uh, music class, and on the first day, the master taught the guitar, uh, you know, he taught us to how, uh, how to play the G and the C and the D chord. He taught us three chords. And he said, go, practice, and come back. So I go home, I practice, my friend practices, and we had a class after, like, I think after two days, okay? And all of us go there, and we, as a group, we're supposed to practice what the master is taught. But this man was like, he was like, um, sir, I have learned GCD, can you now teach me five more chords? Both the master and everybody there were surprised. And they said, can you show? Play, play and show. So he played the G chord, he, he put the fingers in the string, it looked right, but he played, and there was no sound, they were all muted. Then he played the C chord, again, most of the, most of the strings were muted. Muted is when you're not holding it tight enough that the, the, the string doesn't vibrate. And then the D and the same thing happened. So after playing all those three, he said, see, I'm holding it right. My master said, it's not about holding it right, it's about getting the actual sound. So <laughs> he actually started strumming each of those things and he said, can you hear the sound? No, you can't hear the sound. Okay, it took a while for him to understand, but again he came back in two days and he said, see, now they're making the sound. 
Then the master actually had to show him. And he said, you know what? I have been, I, I have been working on how people learn to learn. So I know how this has to be taught. Just teach me 10 more cards. <laughs> so the master said, now can you shift the cards, OK? So he understands that, you know, um, the, that, uh, that it's not about holding the card. It's about the shifting the card. And then after another week, he comes, and he again comes on with the same dialogue, OK? He's like, now teach me more. And then, and then the master says, show, show me how you're playing the card. And he had this like, you know, the master said, you have to be able to shift cards fast enough. So he comes and he goes. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Now, when do you think this metaphor would be a useful metaphor? Pardon me? When you are an expert at something and someone isn't, but they think they know how to do your job better than you, better you do. It could be in the context of learning. It could be in, in some other context. Because when sometimes people think they know how to do the job that you do, they're measuring completely different parameters than what you are measuring. You remember the one-to-one -one parallel over here? The guy was measuring whether he's holding it, whereas the obvious parameter to measure is the is the sound of it. Yeah. Obviously, you need to do a little bit of analog marking over there. You have to do the associations. But yeah, if I ever say that metaphor, it'll be in the context of if I, for example, if I go to a business, uh, if I'm helping a business and there are three people over there, and if I see that the problem is that the CEO is interfering with the functioning of, uh, let's say, somebody uh, who's a specialist in that area, and the CEO doesn't understand it. He says, why can't data be structured this way? You know, in technical fields, you'll have these hindrances. Then this is a metaphor that would work. Now, again, you have to remember, you need to have, can you say this metaphor in a corporate setting? Pardon me? Can you, can you say it in a conversation that you're having with them? Absolutely. OK, most people think it can't be said in a corporate meeting, but I would uh, disagree because um, I think if you have the leverage to be humorous, you could always tell a metaphor and then shift to another topic. And when I personally tell metaphors or stories, it never appears serious because I want their brain to be in a state of generalization. OK, but if you're there, so for example, you are here, which means your unconscious knows that whatever story is being said is for the purpose of why you are here. Um, and, and, uh, and the other thing is, uh, people overestimate the other person's conscious memory. Uh, you know, sometimes when you think about telling metaphors in corporates or to your friends, you're, you're like, what if they remember all those things and they think I'm crazy? Uh, I mean, I, people have said that to me. But uh, the, the truth is, most times people won't remember the metaphors that you're giving them. Because if it's precise, it's going to create the effect of amnesia. It's like, you know, that's how the structure of time works in your head. The longer you have made something innate, the easier you forget the source of how it happened. For example, how many of you can remember the exact method or the numbers that your math teacher used when she, when she or he was teaching you multiplication? Do you see, do some of you, do you even remember when you learned it? No. Why? Because the skill has become innate. You don't, you don't need to remember the method by which you learned it. OK, and if you could, sometimes you could create, if you, metaphors work like that. The, they, they go and it becomes as if it's your story, as if it's a, it's a thing that happened that you own that story, right? And the more that happens, the less you'll remember it consciously. So. I think if you have two things, the freedom to practice, and if you do the my voice will go with you, I think you'll be able to understand the structure of metaphors and then deliver it. And of course, when you come to up, make the most of it, this entire event runs on metaphors. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. But if someone remembers metaphors for a long time, yeah. 
uh, it means it could mean that the metaphor wasn't relevant to that person. Okay, now I'm going to give you an example of relevancy. So there was a manager, and this manager goes to a conference, and in the conference he hears this story, and he doesn't know if it's a true story or not, but he's fascinated by it. <laughs> and, the, and the story goes like this. You know, the story goes that, you know, that long time ago when America wanted to send somebody to the moon, uh, they had this, they were in severe financial crisis. So in the middle of the project, they sent a team to investigate whether they have to continue the, the project or not. And as the man who comes to investigate steps in, there is this uh, guy who is like keeping the place clean. And he tells them to wait. And he says, let me finish cleaning and then you can go. And you know, the investigation team is like worried and they're like, uh, who do you think you are? You know, um, do you know, do, do you, uh, who, who are you? And, uh, and this guy says, well, I'm the guy who's helping America launch, go to the moon. And these guys are like, what? And he says, well, the scientists here work 24 hours and sometimes 36 hours. And I need to make sure that they have an environment where they're not falling sick and they're able to be healthy. So uh, I'm making sure that they can do that so that America can go to the moon. Now, the manager, of course, he doesn't know if it's a true story or not, which anyway, it isn't. Um, comes back to his office and he's fascinated by the story and there are three individuals in his office who don't perform, okay? The final output of those three people are like zero, they don't perform. The first one is like, life is easy, why should I work, you know? Let, it, let me take it when it comes, if I get fired, I'll get another job, I'll do. Output, zero. Then there's a the second guy, he's like, look at that jerk of a boss. You know, he gets all the credit. And uh, uh, I'm doing all the <coughs> hard work. Okay, output, zero. <laughs> and then the third guy is like, what kind of a work am I doing? Anybody can do this work. Output, zero. Now this manager comes and from luke, fluke or luck, he gets into unconscious rapper with all the three of them. And he tells them the story. Okay, on whom would this metaphor Assuming the manager didn't explain saying moral of the story, um, uh, who on, uh, or didn't put it in an in advice frame, on who would this metaphor have an impact? The third one. The other two guys are going to be like, what a jerk, man, again. <laughs> right? But the third one is going to have some kind of a shift that, that, that would propagate in his life. Right? So, so sometimes the output can be the same, but the internal process that leads to that output may be different between the same, between, between individuals who appear to be performing the same way. Okay, so two couples could fight, but what they do internally to fight, two men could, or women could be angry, but what they do to get angry could be very different. Uh, um, two children may or may not study well, but what they do to not study well could be very different. For the metaphors to be effective, they have to be targeted and precise. You remember we spoke about verb, verb, verb? You have to understand the process inside that person's head that is creating that output. Then, and only then, metaphors become easy. Okay, so there's a, there's a study called the Meta Model. When you come in December, maybe I'll share more of it. But the crux of the Meta Model is, you remember when we were doing the swish? When you, we were doing the swish? You remember the question that I was asking people, how do you make yourself angry? What do you do in your head in order to create that behavior? You remember that question? So, my brain works like that. I ask that question every single time. The way I look at human beings or human behavior is I think of everything as an output. Procrastination, output. Motivation, output. Low self-esteem, output. High self-esteem, output. Okay, I like to know, I like to take off the labels and I like to... And regarding labels, I just want to share one thing with you. 
when people come and ask me stuff like, can you work with children who have ADD? Or can you work with people who have OCD? I say, I don't know. I have no idea what these things mean. Okay, because um, the reason I say that is because out of six children I have seen who were labeled to have dyslexia, none of the six children had anything in common. Nothing at all. I'll give you an example of one of this child from Mumbai. His mother bought to me and he said, and she said that he has uh, uh, dyslexia. I said, can you, can she work on, can you work on her? Him. I said, I, do, I can't. I don't know what you mean by dyslexia. Give me specifics. What do you see him doing or not doing that makes you believe that he has a problem? Right? So we made a list. There were three things. One was, one had to do with spelling. Another had to do with social interaction. Another had to do with, uh, um, I don't even remember now. Okay. I said, okay, what I can do is I don't know if I can help you solve dyslexia. I could help you solve these three conditions. Same thing, a girl came and asked me, can you help me overcome depression? I said, when you say you have depression, what do you feel or what do you do that you want to change? She gave me a list. I said, I can change that. Because I don't believe that there is a thing called depression in a box that's gotten into your body. Okay. In NLP, you call that as nominalization. A nominalization is when someone takes a verb and then converts it into a, a noun. For example, when you see people who are depressed, what they do is they go through a very specific process. And if you travel a lot, you can find them in the airport. Um, they'll sit in a corner, okay, and this would be the eye movement patterns. Eyes going right down means they're paying attention to physical sensations, feelings. Eyes going left down means they're paying attention to their internal chatter. Eyes going top up to the left specifically means they're remembering memories, image, mem Im memories in the form of images. So what the person probably was doing is, the stomach is feeling so heavy. Right? They're paying attention to the heaviness in the stomach. I'm always feeling like this life is terrible. And then they're looking up and they're seeing the pictures of everything that has gone wrong in their life. Okay? Now, I don't know about that person who has depression. If I did that for one hour, <laughs> <laughs> and when you typically notice somebody who's doing that, they have a tendency to keep going on a loop. Right? They don't stop. It's in, in a microtrance. And then they say, I don't know, I just have depression. Right? Like, the kgs of it. Right? So I'd like to <laughs> I like I like to change that to how do you what do you do to depress yourself? Right? So I'm always believing anything that a person does is a process. And what they think as a problem is merely an output. The process may be unconscious. You, what I mean by unconscious? You remember that spelling thing you did? Okay, how do you know if, it's, if, some, if something is the right spelling or not? You see those letters. Okay, can you see those letters again in encyclopedia? Yes. See the letters, and instead of C, change it to X. What happens? How many of you feel something wrong in your body there? This is something you do every single time you spell a word. But the process is unconscious, which means it happens so fast that it's not in your conscious awareness. And I believe every human behavior, every human activity is, a, is an output, an outcome of a process. Now, it doesn't mean that it's in their conscious awareness. So a person who is being depressed would go like this, but no, have no clue that they're going over that, that map. But an outsider can see the eye movements and come to a conclusion that this is what the person is doing to depress themselves. So the, the thinking over there is how do you depress yourself, right? Now going back to the child, one of the things that the mother gave was spelling, right? So we like taking challenges with spelling with children because it's one of the easiest things to fix. What you do is you, get, you write 
See, when people spell, what are the two things you did to get it right? You saw the letters, and you had a feeling that validated if it's the right spelling or not. So most times when kids don't spell, what happens is instead of making a picture of the word, they're trying to sound it out. They're going encyclopedia. Their eyes goes left down. Then you, pro you, you know for a fact that they have a problem with spelling. So now you have to install the process of seeing the picture and feeling right. Metaphors and storytelling is one way of installing a process. For spelling, I have a simpler thing, you know, that, that, that I think Robert Dills first found out. I, I don't know if it's Robert or Baron or one of them. Uh, the process goes like this. You write the word, small words, in diff each alphabet in a different color. Okay, so let's say you write apple, and A is in a different color, P is in a different color, L is in a different color, E is in a different color, other P is in a different color. You show the letters to them for a while, and then you keep it down. And then you say, what was the color of the letter L? Now, in order for the child to answer that, what experience does it presuppose? That they see and remember the picture that they saw a while ago. So if he says green, now, in the process of doing that, the child has already seen the entire picture as one chunk. If you teach people to spell this way, then it doesn't matter whether there's three letters or ten letters. For them, it's one image, one chunk. It worked. It works every single time. It didn't work with this kid. <laughs> okay? So, Harley and I were, like, uh, very confused. And... Uh, the breakthrough happened when we were, you know, we were asking him to spell a word. I forgot the word. Um, what was the word? Where's Harney? Um, Harney, do you remember the, 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 the boy who wasn't spelling well? We asked him to spell a particular word, and he spelled it wrong. What word was the word? Pardon me? League. And what did he spell it as? Right. So the word, we told him spell league, and he spelled it as L-E-A-G. Now, Harney and I did a test. What we did was we forgot about the spelling and everything. We started entertaining the mother and the son, you know, uh, having food, chit-chatting. And in the middle of it, we looked at him and we asked him, what is the spelling of league? And he say, gave the same exact wrong spelling. Remember, I think of every function as an output, a, a, a systematic function, a process that is going on to create that output. So Harney asked the brilliant question. She said, how does he know to spell it in that particular way every single time. This can't be about memory. In fact, he has a perfect way of spelling it incorrectly. So, so I asked him, I looked at him and I said, I said, what if that's the wrong spelling? He said, no, it's the correct spelling. <laughs> I said, no, it's the wrong spelling. He said, it's the correct. I said, what if I take a dictionary and show you that it is the wrong spelling? And here was the key to changing his behavior. He said, he looked sad and he said, it would make me very sad. And I said, how does that make you sad? He said, because it's not correct. <laughs> <laughs> so I immediately understood what was going on. He had rules, his own rules of how things must be spelled. And he was, and according to him, those rules are accurate, and it has to be spelled that way. And I also understood that it's coming from the misconception in his mind that you could actually take a word in English and spell it phonetically. So what I did is I did this thing. Oh, I said, oh, so I, okay, so which means you don't know about isomorphic and non-isomorphic. He said, what is that? I said, well... You know, languages like Hindi and Marathi are isomorphic. Okay, what is the presupposition in that, by the way? No, when I, yeah, of course, you know, yeah, one of the presuppositions is he knows those languages and he knew them well. So I said, Hindi and Marathi are isomorphic. What's the presupposition there? That there are other languages that are not isomorphic. Remember, I want to insert the belief. I want him to come to the conclusion that, that there are languages that are non-isomorphic. So I said, yeah, Hindi and Marathi are isomorphic. And then he said, uh, what does that mean? I said, well, in Hindi, in Hindi and Marathi. 
Again, just saying those two languages to presuppose that there could be other languages where it's not true. I said in Hindi and Marathi, the way the word sounds is exactly how the notation goes. Languages where there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the sound and the notation are isomorphic in nature. I don't even know if the word is called isomorphic. I just had to make something up, okay? So I said that to him, and he said, oh, that's awesome. And then I said, by the way, I said, do you know who made the dictionary? And he said, see, who made the dictionary is already breaking the fact that it's not a set of universal rules, okay? I said, who made the dictionary? He said, I don't know. And I said, um, I made this up, but I said, <laughs> I said, long time ago, and Harini was having the fun of her life. Where is she? Yeah, so I said, long time ago, there was an old, drunk, fat man. And he knew the spelling to all the words, but he was drunk. And he was afraid that people may not know the right spelling for the words. So when he was drunk, he woke up and he had this thought that I have to document the spelling for everything. So he wrote down the spelling of every word. Now remember, he was drunk, so he made some mistakes. But the mistakes have been there for thousands of years that now they are the right spelling. <laughs> Thank you. It worked. It wasn't that he couldn't make pictures. He had a strong sort of belief that there is a right way to, right way to smell, right? So when, uh, when I work with people, I am always looking at what specifically are they doing or not doing, and I don't go by the labels. So for me, I have no idea what OCD means. I have no idea what ADD means. I have no idea what ADHD means. I have no idea of any of those things. I even have no idea of what lack of ownership means. If someone comes and says, my employee lacks ownership, I say, what do you specifically not see this person doing that makes you recognize he or she doesn't own the project or he or she doesn't own the business? You get the difference? Okay, from going from a noun to a verb. That's called nominalization. Now, for me, that is very important because I'm go because of this specific example that I've heard from John. The example is, imagine if there is a parent, okay, there's a good parent, they have a child, and the child is, you know, showing some behaviors that the parents are unable to understand. And uh, because of that, because of that, they are very worried. And a part of them is thinking, have we done wrong parenting? Is something wrong with us? And then they take the child to a doctor, and the doctor accurately diagnoses that she has certain symptoms of what is called as um, autism. Okay, I'm going to attempt my best to make this legible for you, although I'm just going to write some random alphabets. Okay, so, so let's say, first of all, autism, at, per definition, is a, what is called as a broad categorization which means it's not a specific thing. It could be one out of, uh, it could be three to four symptoms out of, out of 50 to 60 symptoms that exist. So you remember, so let's say th there is L, M, N, there's uh, A, B, C, there's X, Y, Z, and there's P, Q, R. Let's say these are the various symptoms. And let's say this particular child was showing the symptom for L, N, M. So they take the daughter, so they take the daughter to the doctor and then the doctor accurately diagnoses that she has these two, so she must have some condition that they call autism. Now the parents are worried, but they're good parents, they don't want to scare her, they come back, they're taking all the pre pre precaution, nothing wrong so far. But what happens is they go to this party, they meet this friend. Who has a friend whose daughter has autism? And she has these two symptoms. Okay? So they, this, this friend talks about these two symptoms to the parents. Now the parents are worried. Now what they come is they come and they Google autism. 
and then Google gives them all of this. Okay? And a few more that doesn't exist. <laughs> and they have read all of that. Now what happens is let's say this particular symptom that the child didn't have originally is related to being careless about things that they pick up, like a glass. Now what's going to happen is that as once this belief is planted in the parent's head that the child has all of these things or is going to come at some point in time, when the child picks up the glass the next time, well-intentioned parents, they, they want to just not you know, hurt the daughter consciously. So the child picks up the glass. What happens is from far, the muscles of the parents tense to go and hold the glass if she were to drop it. They don't know that the unconscious of the child is watching. For example, a couple came to me and they said that, you know, the child, she was three years old, around three, that she's banging her head when she gets irritated. And I asked, who did she learn that from? And both of them said, but uh, she doesn't do it in front of the child. <laughs> <laughs> the solution was simple, and I, and I thought of the solution because there's a guy in Delhi, his name is, uh, he was one of our youngest EIS, um, Ridwan, and one of the things that he did was, uh, I mean, he had, uh, he'd done two sessions of years, he hasn't completed it. But one of the things he did was, there was a small baby who was, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, four years, uh, who, wasn't able, who wasn't spitting after brushing, and was swallowing it. And the parents were trying to tell the child, spit, spit, spit. But all that Ridwan did was he went, and he, brushed, he got into unconscious rapper with the child, okay, by mirroring the child. Then he brushed and he spit. And he didn't speak anything. And the child brushed and the child spit. For the parents, that was like a, like a miracle. So I told the mother, I want to try an experiment. Let's fix your behavior of banging the head and let's see what happens. And sure enough, the child dropped the behavior, behavior too. Uh, the child has incredible, just like adults, have incredible ability to know what is going on. Okay, unconsciously. So, with this specific child, when the parents tighten the muscle over there, ready to catch, unconsciously the child does recognize that the parents are tightening the muscle. What does that presuppose? That she's going to drop. Now, if she's a child who has a deep unconscious rapper with the parents, their beliefs become her belief. Okay, presuppositions. Remember, presuppositions can work very, 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 very effectively, and you won't even know when they are happening. Uh, I, I've, I've said this example in so many events, but I'm going to share it one more time. There was this uh, neighbor of mine uh, who had invited some priest to come and work on her, and, uh, you know, and uh, the kind of priest who says he's chasing devils. And, uh, um, the, the, and, 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 and he made her stand, and he made her count, and he asked her for the favorite color, and she said her favorite color is green. So uh, he made her count, uh, say the color by closing her eyes, saying green, 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 like for like, a, like six to eight minutes. Now, I don't know if you know, but that's one of the oldest form of hypnosis. It's called transcendental meditation. And as she was doing that, he was standing there tapping the feet exactly at the rate and speed at which he was breathing. It's, an, it's called crossover mirroring. And uh, like how you rock your baby when it's crying? Yeah? So he was doing that. And when, she, when he noticed her go into a trance, he said, Now evil spirit, come out of her and tell me your name. Okay, what does it presuppose? There's an evil spirit that it can come out of her and also tell the name after coming out. Yeah. <laughs> now, she did weird things, okay? She spoke some weird thing. <laughs> it was scary in the beginning, but... <laughs> but then later it occurred to me, man, that's a presupposition. 
If you put someone in a nice hypnotic state and if you say, when did the aliens kidnap you? They'll, they will come up with memories of aliens kidnapping them. Uh, it, it is funny because one of, uh, there was a hypnotist who came here and he learned reframing and then he went and he put his wife in a nice hypnotic state and, uh, and he told her after, so he calls me panicking, okay, and I ask him what happened. He says, my wife is speaking in strange language. And I said, what did you do? He said, I did just the reframing. I said, give me the exact steps. And apparently after he finished the reframing, he told his wife, now you can take 15 minutes and then come back to the normal state. And to her, not being in a normal state, which was presupposed, meant speaking strange languages. <laughs> so, when the, when the parent is tensing the muscle, the presupposition is that she is going to drop. Remember, it's a presupposition to you and me. For them, it's reality. And when someone has a belief that's strong, and if they're unconscious rapper with the child, the child will non-verbally pick the same belief. So what effectively happens is from having these two conditions, she starts having, over a period of time, all the conditions that she didn't have and that don't even fit in the basket called autism to begin with, right? So. That's the danger of uh, sometimes nominalizing, right? So that's why I always ask, what do you see specifically that has to be worked upon? So the way I think of everything is that there is an output. Every human behavior is an output and an outcome. And what are they doing internally to create that output? That is where my questions come from. Like, how do you, what do you do to become anxious? What do you do to bite your nails? And I think if you can ask yourself that question every time you're dealing with people, then you'll come to a precision about what is going on that is making them behave that particular way. Right? So I think creativity, I think uh, um, um, connection, I think... Um, the positive traits as well as all negative traits are processes. They're outcomes of a process. If you understand the process, then you can become precise in your metaphor. You remember those three guys? Okay? Now, if I was talking to the second guy, I would first have to understand that in his head he's thinking that the boss is a, is a jerk. Then the metaphor would be completely different. And for the first guy who thinks life is good, it'll take care, the metaphor is going to be completely different, right? It's going to be about, it's going to be a parallel story of where something is snatched away from someone when they didn't realize it was coming. So that's, that's how you learn metaphors. Okay, was that useful? Yes. Is it sufficient enough for you to go and train yourself by reading the book, uh, My Voice Will Go With You? Um, now, Matt Milton is a sneaky hypnotist, you know, like every time he works with his clients, he would, he, would, he would say, my friend would tell me that my voice will go with you and become your ideas, people, and places whenever you want to find the solution. And it would happen so that when people sleep and when they wake up, they sometimes hear Milton's voice when they have uh, questions that need to be answered. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.